Thank you all so much for being here this morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Matthew Wells. I'm the research director here at the LNI Center. Uh, on behalf of the uh, staff, I want to welcome everyone to the LNI Research Library and Preserve. Uh, our public lectures at uh, the library highlight areas that were scholarly and personal interest to Mr. LNI. Those areas include the languages, literatures, and cultures of East Asia, as well as the, the uh, diverse cultures of Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent the horticulture, ecology, and natural environment of Little Sarasota Bay and uh, Florida more generally, and the cultures and languages of the indigenous peoples of the American Southeast. Today, we are very uh, happy to welcome Professor Hans von Ess to the, uh, to the Eid Center. Uh, Dr. von Ess studied Sinology and Turkic Studies at the University of Hamburg and spent two years at Fudan University in Shanghai before finishing his PhD in 1992. He was assistant professor at the, at the Institute of Sinology in Heidelberg before becoming chair at the Institute for Sinology yeah. at Ludwig uh, Maximilians University or LMU in Munich in 1998. In addition to his work as a professor, mentor, and scholar, he has also served as the president of the Max Weber Foundation, vice president for international affairs at LMU, and the vice president for research at LMU, and has served on the editorial boards of scholarly journals in Europe, the United States, and China. Dr. Von Ness is a specialist in the intellectual history of pre-modern China, particularly in the areas of early Chinese historiography and philosophy. In addition to over 100 articles, translations, book chapters, and reviews, Dr. Von Ness is the author of numerous, numerous monographs, including, and these are my terrible translations from German, <laughs> the 101 most important questions about China, Hu Hong, Knowing Words, the Zhu Yuan, Taoism from Lao Tzu to today, and politics and history in ancient China, Ban Ma Yitong, and uh, in 2021, Chinese philosophy from Confucius to the present. Uh, Dr. Fanes's lecture today, entitled The Confucian Analects, a fresh look at a classic from ancient China, is, uh, I guess, comes out of uh, several years, the last several years that he has been uh, producing a new translation of the Analects. Uh, Confucius, and will describe the ways in which the compilers of that text sometimes use the rhetoric of learning and politeness to disguise atrocious and terrifying acts. Uh, so a very, very, a very fitting uh, Halloween weekend lecture. <laughs> uh, would you please uh, help me give a very warm welcome to our guest. Thank you, Nick, for this very kind introduction, and thank you, everybody, for coming in here and listening to my talk. I've been to the LNI Center before, uh, Professor Niehauser from the University of uh, Medicine with uh, uh, Consin um, has had several workshops here that, that I participated in. And he has known LNI, um, they were actually colleagues for, some, uh, for a long uh, time. It's a great pleasure to be back here after COVID. And yes, I have been working uh, on the analects, the Confucian analects during the time of COVID. I had uh, much time uh, during the evenings uh, because there was no social, there were no social events. And so it was good to spend the time with Confucius. <laughs> and uh, with that, I uh, would like to start. Um, um, I'm actually going to concentrate on one particular important word in uh, in the analytics, and it's one of the most easy words, uh, seemingly, uh, seemingly most easy words um, in Chinese Chinese uh, the Chinese language. But sometimes these easy words are also the most difficult ones. The Chinese word "when" is a case in point. It is composed of only four strokes and most easy to write. The earliest Chinese dictionary explaining characters says that it was invented to convey the idea of something painted in an interlocking or crisscrossing way, the pattern. Apparently, the basic meaning of this word when is that of adornment or even more explicitly embroidery on a plain piece of cloth. I've also read that its origin may have been originally a fish scale. Um, uh, the Chinese uh, word is lin, but it may have been cognate with when a um, uh, long time ago. And you see here a picture of fish scales, uh, many of which together give a nice pattern. 
every uh, translator of ancient Chinese texts, and, and uh, I mean, this is it's interesting to see this. It looks similar as this character. And so maybe something is uh, to this idea. Uh, every uh, translator of ancient Chinese texts knows how difficult it is to properly translate this word. In modern Chinese, it is used in such compounds as you see here, when culture, when means civilization, when the letters, uh, when journal article, when she and documents and so forth. Mm -hmm. It always has to do with civilized behavior and is thus a character that for most Chinese has a very positive connotation. But I'm going to challenge this idea <laughs> in my talk today. <laughs> um, this started very early, this positive uh, uh, connotation. One of the most distinctive characteristics of ancient Chinese civilization is its, is its opposition of two sides of government, namely Wen, the civil aspect that stresses education and reform, and Wu, uh, the military one that is characterized by the use of force uh, in war or in punishments. Both sides are necessary for a good government, and this has never uh, been more openly expressed than with the selection of Wen and Wu as posthumous names for the two founding kings of the Zhou dynasty at the end of the second millennium before Christ. A famous saying in the Confucian Analects states that King Wen of Zhou refused to attack the depraved last king of the Shang dynasty, even though two thirds of the states in the realm had to, submitted to him already. Only his son, King Wu, then finally used force to put an end to the Shang dynasty. When in this case means leniency and the idea that force is to be avoided as long as it is possible. But sometimes you can't avoid to use force. In um, another famous saying, Confucius, when hard pressed by enemies at the city of Quang, exclaims, since King Wen is dead, is this Wen not here? Would heaven want to let this Wen perish? This one uh, who died at a later time, he means himself, would not have had the opportunity to, to take part in this Wen. Since heaven has not yet made this Wen perish, what should the man from this place, Quang, be able to do to me? This, the meaning of this saying is famously a, a difficult one. And what I want you to understand today is that when reading these analytics, uh, they, they sound very nice, but very often you simply don't understand what is going on and why he's <laughs> saying this. So uh, you need some background uh, knowledge. Um, and well, this is, uh, I'm going to explain this. So specialists of ancient Chinese phonetics uh, have pointed here to the fact that uh, this uh, uh, here, uh, this, uh, which means this, means the place where Confucius came from and that he's actually speaking in this local dialect um, of the state uh, in the east of China where he came from. But uh, I don't want to bore you with philological details here. Uh, I'm sure you're not too interested in that. But this question of what when actually means, this is central to my talk, and I think it's interesting to consider. It is clear that for Confucius, this when here means something very, very positive. He thinks something is in him here. Some translators have rendered this as culture, just like when or in modern Chinese. Um, and maybe it's just the civilized behavior that this founder of the early Zhou dynasty had introduced in China. Um, so um, uh, one thing is also certain that uh, it does not have much to do with literary uh, works that um, uh, were produced in early China, but what exactly it is that uh, we don't know. Together with the Tao Te Ching, ascribed to Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, the Confucian Analects are probably the most uh, well-known book, uh, Chinese book in the West. It has been translated so often into China, Western languages that some commentators in Chinese studies have actually started to make fun of these translations. Uh, there's actually, for someone who's looking at them from, uh, the, uh, from, from afar, not much progress. And one wonders 
whether this enormous amount of time uh, that has to go into a translation uh, is really justified in all cases. And of course, would I now am doing a new translation, so I have to justify this as well. <laughs> um, my reason is that uh, the one that I mentioned before, that there are so many passages which simply are very hard to understand. And uh, reading uh, this text for a couple of years, I've started to get some ideas about some things that I think previous translators haven't got, yeah. and I want to share them with you. So this will is my topic. It occurs in 28 of altogether 1516 paragraphs, and these paragraphs are distributed quite evenly over the 20 chapters of the Analects. The chapter which has most occurrences of the character when is the fifth chapter in which this word is used in five out of 29 paragraphs. And so this chapter is a good starting point for an analysis and also for understanding what goes on in the end of analects and what you actually have to know in order to understand them beyond the ordinary translations, uh, which there are so many of. By and large, the fifth chapter of the analects consists of judgments of people. And this is what the ancient Chinese like to do. Judgments of people are very important because they teach you something, what you have to know when you want to select someone for office. You have to know, uh, to understand the character of a person in order to put him in the right place. And this is one of the things that in ancient Chinese uh, culture was an art that was uh, developed uh, to a very high degree, I think more than other uh, early civilizations uh, which did other things. In the first half of this fifth chapter, Confucius judges on the behavior of some of his students, while in the second half, he voices his opinions on famous persons of the past and of his contemporaries. A major figure in this chapter is Confucius student Zigong, the name of which we see here, the only rich man among the disciples who in 5.4 asks Confucius uh, what he thinks of uh, about himself. And then Confucius says, you are a vessel. Confucius gives back uh, uh, that, that he is a vessel. And when Zigong then asks what kind of vessel, he answers a gent Julian vessel. Uh, we don't know what the Julian is. But it is obvious that is uh, that Confucius spoke in fun of uh, Zagung. He accuses him of being no more, probably no more than just a precious object to be placed somewhere without having any actual use. In modern China, the people say about um, uh, about uh, about politicians who don't decide anything that they are actually uh, pots uh, where you have plants and they are placed somewhere, <laughs> but they don't really do so. So this might be similar here. Um, in 5.9, uh, I'm jumping here, Zigong politely uh, uh, says, that he's no equal to Confucius' favorite student, Yen Hui, a young student who is always praised in this text. Uh, it's the favorite disciple. Confucius agrees, uh, um, but with uh, regard to Yen Hui, uh, then puts himself on the same level as uh, Zigong. We don't have to go into this here now. In 5.13, which is a very uh, famous saying, Zigong expresses to wish to act the wish to act according to the famous golden rule, which he here puts in a negative way. This is this universal rule <laughs> that we have in all philosophy, uh, philosophies worldwide. Um, uh, what I do not want that others do to me, I also do not want uh, to do to others. Confucius then tells him that he is not uh, going to be able to stand uh, to live up to this same. <laughs> and in 514, Zigong exclaims about Confucius, about the masters, when Jack, and you uh, have again um, here the, uh, the, uh, the word when in this word, we can obtain knowledge, but we cannot uh, obtain any knowledge about his explanations of human nature and the way of heaven. Uh, the master indeed doesn't speak uh, very much about these two subjects mentioned here, 
But uh, the question is, what does uh, Zilong mean here with this Wenja? Martin Kern from Princeton has devoted a long article to the meaning of this in early China. And he comes to the conclusion that Wenjiang meant something like decorum, but had nothing to do with letters or literature before a very late uh, period, um, the first century of our era, about 600 years of, after uh, the death of Confucius. So I tend to agree that this is the case. What does it really mean here? We do not really know, although it looks like the original idea of adornment must be at least part of the idea. In order to get closer to an understanding, it might be helpful to look at other passages in the fifth chapter of the Analects in which this word when occurs. And it always occurs in one specific uh, context. Uh, I suggest to take a look at a sequence that spans from Luni 514 to um, 523. Uh, this sequence starts with the student Zegung's exclamation about the accomplishments of his master and is then continued by a brief comment on the poor student uh, Zelu. This is the third uh, student mentioned in this chapter. I'm not going to speak about more students here, so I don't want to uh, put too much into uh, knowledge into this talk. This Zelu is Desperate, uh, he tries to understand what the master with his broad uh, uh, knowledge taught. And the text then said, when Zulu heard anything, if he had not yet succeeded in carrying it into practice, he was only afraid lest he should hear something else. So he didn't want to hear more than uh, what he had uh, heard before because it took him so much time to understand this. And maybe the master uh, just said these short sentences and then Zulu had to think about this and didn't grasp the meaning just as we very often don't grasp uh, the meaning. Zugong in 516 again asked the question this time about the name of a certain person called Kung Wenze. Confucius gives an answer, and in the following two passages, makes comments about two famous statesmen of the past, namely, uh, uh, which Yen um, Ping and uh, a man called Zhejiang. And in 519 to 522, uh, Confucius makes similar statements about more people. In 523, he finally speaks about his own students who are premature and need more education. This is clearly a long sequence of similar, more or less meaningful statements about persons of the past. At first sight, one asks. Yes, yes, no, I, 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 I switch to the next um, and we get back to this. I just wanted to give you a short summary of what is going on. And now I go into detail, then you can uh, can can see better what I'm doing. Just uh, This was just a summary. Um, we have now have to take a closer look and then you will get what I hope so, <laughs> what I want to tell you. Let us begin with 516 I just spoke about. This is here. Zegong asked, why was Kong Wenzi called Wen? The master answered, he was quick and loved learning and was not ashamed to inquire of those below him. For this reason, the reasons they called him Wen. I have already, so very positive here. I have already mentioned that the names of the two founders, Wen and Wu of the Zhou dynasty, were posthumous names. Posthumous names were in ancient China given to emperors, kings, other princes, uh, territorial lords, and outstanding officials immediately after their death. The text uh, from a little bit later time states that this was done during the funeral as part of the ceremony by those who had assembled to mourn the dead person. So at this funeral, people actually gathered, uh, thought about the person who had just deceased, and then thought about one name they could give him, a posthumous name that would grasp uh, what this man had done or how he had been like. And this is the name this uh, person is then afterwards usually remembered with. 
In a collection of old documents, the exact date of which we do not know, there's an old catalog which lists about a hundred such posthumous names and the character traits for which they were given to the deceased. The catalog lists several different positive characteristics which could, could lead to one's being given the posthumous name of Wynne. One of them resembles what Confucius said in the uh, case of Kogwenze very much. Uh, and you see this here. Uh, I have put the Chinese characters in red. I don't want to go into detail about this, but it seems to me that Confucius is actually, when he gives this answer to his student, quoting from a catalog. So these are not his own words, but he gives a standard answer. We all know when it means this. Someone who likes to study and uh, so uh, very positive things about him. But um, it is possible that this answer here uh, does not necessarily reflect Confucius' own judgment. So he may have given this answer just in order to say this is what people wanted to say about this person. Uh, I may have some second thought about, about this. This Hong Wen's story is very interesting for today's subjects. Uh, first, it is interesting to note that he had the same surname as Confucius, both were called Hong. Um, our sources uh, do not allow us to tell whether there was any con uh, connection between the two families, but between the two states there, uh, where this Conwenza and Confucius lived, there were very close connections. And it's interesting to think about this, although it's not in the texts. Um, we read about this Conwenza that he was a commander of troops in the state of Wei, where Confucius had taken refuge for a long time after um, he had had to leave his home to the state of Lu further to the east. Uh, I don't want to go into detail about this story, but uh, maybe it's not that important, but it's important to know that Confucius worked there for a, lot, a long time and knew what was going on in this state, uh, state uh, very well. Kung Wenzel was married to a daughter of the state of Wei. Here you have a map in order just uh, to show you. Confucius came from here. This is the state of Wei, where he went to when he, he had to leave for political reasons, this uh, state of Lu. Then he was there and met with this Hu Wenzi. So um, in this state, um, there was a duke um, who had a wife from, uh, no, this Hu Wenzi was married to a daughter of the Duke of Wei. And this duke, in turn, had a wife from the state of Sung, and this wife was called Nansen. This woman had also, though she was married to the duke, asked him to bring a lover from the state of Sung, which lies in between, to Wei. And the duke had consented. So um, she was known for this licentiousness, and the student, one of the students of uh, Confucius, uh, was very upset with his master when he went to see this woman and said, "I'm not going to, uh, to work, and uh, it's not nice." And Confucius had to justify that he actually went to see her, uh, but she was apparently really well known also in her uh, uh, home state of Song, where a historical text the Zhuozhuan states that this people sang about this couple, the lover and the wife of the duke. She's satisfied now, your sow in heat. Why not give us back our fine stuff ball? This is really, and this is really an insult. And you can see that I mean, how, how upset these people were. Uh, Ashamed of what he, of course, considered to be inappropriate behavior on behalf of this Nanze, the son of the Duke and the Crown Prince in Wei uh, wanted to kill this woman, who actually may have been his mother. The plot against her was discovered, and therefore the Crown Prince had to fly to another neighboring state. After the death of the Duke, his own son became Duke of, uh, uh, so the son of the Crown Prince became Duke of Wei a story completely unheard of in Chinese history. The grandson follows the grandfather, although the son is still alive, although living in, uh, uh, in exile abroad. Confucius also knew uh, this uh, licentious woman, as I say, uh, uh, said, but what is more important is to know that in this state now, there were two political factions. 
one party consisting of supporters of the crown prince, the other one of those of his son, uh, the grandson of the former duke. Kongwense, whose wife was a sister of the crown prince, obviously be belonged to the faction of the crown prince. In way, there lived a dignitary who had married the daughter of the lover of Nanze from Song. Kongwense in 484 forced this man to get a divorce of his wife and then gave him one of his own daughters in marriage. Obviously, he wanted to get him over to his own faction, uh, but this didn't work out uh, since the dignitary uh, liked his wife, and uh, so he took uh, the daughter, but then he lived with two women. And um, uh, this Kongwense then was absolutely furious about this and wanted to attack the uh, place where this man lived. He consulted with Confucius about this, but Confucius then, uh, then uh, taught him this here. Uh, he said, as for matters of sacrificials, I have studied them, but matters of war, I have no idea. So he didn't want to give him an answer about how to make war against this man. And uh, then uh, Confucius made this famous uh, remark that he said, a bird chooses its tree, but how can a tree choose its bird? And he turned around and went back to his home in the state of Lu and left way forever. So he said, I'm the bird and I choose the place where I want to work and not they can uh, keep me here. Then Kung Winsa tried to stop him saying, how sh should I pr presume to plan private matter? I was only trying to foster troubles in the domain of way. This is the translation of uh, Durant and others, your teacher. Well, Confucius thought of this excuse that Kuhnwenzel made, uh, we do not know what, uh, but we may assume that he simply did not believe him. Although there certainly was a public aspect to this attempt uh, to get the dignitary into the camp of the crown prince, he obviously also had private reasons to be angry with the dignitary who had spurned his daughter. And this was then the end of Confucius' travels abroad for the last years of his life. He then stayed at home in Lu and kept out of po uh, uh, politics. This is what makes this story uh, very important. It was simply the end of politics for Confucius because he was upset with everything. We have a saying here in Lu that, in a very positive way, explains the, has explained the meaning of Wen in the posthumous name of Kung, Kung Wenze. But from the other source, we know that Confucius judged on Kung Wenze in a negative way, and it, it was the behavior of, the, of this Kung Wenze which influenced his final decision to leave the state of Wei and return to Lu. At this point, I have to introduce another passage from chapter 19 of uh, the Analects, in which the disciple of Confucius says, when a pity person commits a transgression, he is sure to gloss it over. And there, this gloss over is also the meaning of the word win. <laughs> I actually wonder whether Confucius may have thought of it when he was asked to explain the posthumous name of Kong Winsen. Having in mind the excuse of this man, how could I presume to plan private matters? I was trying to foster still uh, troubles in the domain of uh, way. The idea of glossing over one's faults immediately makes sense. So this Kungwense may have been someone who was much better at glossing over his mistakes than at diligently studying and inquiring of persons below him, as was the official explanation of this name. So what I think is Confucius gave the official explanation, but he thought something quite different about his person. When checking the other instances where the character when occurs in the fifth chapter of the Lunyu, we make the discovery that there are four more persons who were named when after the net, uh, their death. In 517 and 518, Confucius first called the positive comments on uh, two famous statements. I have already said this, uh, but in 519, he comments on Zhang Wenzhong, the statesman who had lived two generations before himself in Lu and had dominated politics there. The master said, 
Zhang Wenzhong housed his sacred tortoises in a hall where the column capitals were carved in the shape of mountains and the roof beams were decorated with images of water plants. How could he be considered wise? Interesting, again, a person who had this win, uh, nobody understands what this actually really means. Um, again, but it's interesting to see we have again a man uh, who has this win in his name. And who does uh, the, the, some things which in the end then are uh, said as not very wise. He apparently simply overdid uh, what uh, was uh, the normal standard of behavior. Um, so uh, the dec uh, decoration uh, that he gave to this tortoise here, uh, apparently, it was a nice tortoise here in this garden. And uh, and Ida, I'm sure, knew about this passage here in the uh, uh, in the analysts. So, but um, uh, uh, it is interesting uh, here that that this person is criticized for exaggerations again, and I uh, pres uh, assume that he presumed too great a degree of adornment. And again, I think uh, in this one here, there's a double sense, uh, uh, just as in the former case. And this may be true um, then for the next passage as well, 520, you again have persons who are, uh, who are called a uh, when. The Zhang asked, it's another student, uh, Prime Minister Zhu Wen was given three times the post of Prime Minister, and yet he never showed a sign of pleasure. He was removed from his office three times, and yet it never showed a sign of resentment. When the incoming Prime Minister took over, he invariably provided him with a full account of the official state of affairs. And, then said back, um, and what do you make of Prime Minister Zhu Wen? The master said, he certainly was dutiful. <laughs> Didn't he also deal well with others? I translated here one very important character, Jin, which may, uh, normally is translated as humane uh, in analex translations, but I think uh, it actually means couldn't you also deal well with others? And then Confucius says, I don't know that. On what account should he have been called someone who dealt well with others? So here again, you see that Confucius is actually. Uh, here's the story about a man who's famous also in many other texts. This man is always called the wonderful person who is really uh, very good at Confucius, has some reservations about this. And the question that I, uh, we have to ask us here is, what is wrong with this person? So uh, Confucius, very dutiful. He did everything like he should do it, but maybe he didn't really understand um, how you really do politics. And this is why, the reason why he was dismissed three times and then got back into office, but then he was dismissed again. So something was wrong with him here. And I think this is what this story here is all about. Uh, I don't want to go into detail too uh, much here, but it's interesting to proceed then to the second half of this saying, here, this, uh, the same student again asks the question. He says, uh, when Master Tsui assassinated the Lord of Qi, Chen Wenzhi, whose estate amounted to 10 teams of horses, abandoned all that he possessed and left in order to be able to avoid meeting him. When he came to the first state, he again said, they are just like our dignitary Master Tsui. So he avoided meeting them too and went to another state where he also said, they are just like our dignitary Sui. What about him? The master answered, he was pure. And the giant asked, was he not able to deal with others well? Confucius answered, I don't know that. On what account should he have been called someone who dealt well with others? So again, you have this reservation here about this person who apparently is a wonderful guy. He's pure. But Confucius says, well, pure, yes, but not perfect. The background of this passage is a long and very story about the assassination of uh, a duke uh, in Qi in 548 BC, three years after Confucius was born. An old dignitary and commander of Qi named Tsuju had taken a young widow as his wife, although Chen Wenzhi advised him against it on the basis of an oracle. Duke Zhang of Qi, Qi now, uh, uh, so, so, no, yes, the commander, this old man had taken this young widow, but the 
Duke of Qi, Duke Grand of Qi, now began to have an affair with the young wife of Master Tsui Zhu, whereupon the latter became enraged. He pretended to be ill, and the prince pretended to ask about his health, although he was actually stalking this woman. Uh, then the trap set uh, for him by Tsui Zhu snapped shut, shut. The duke was killed with his entire entourage. At this point, uh, this is why I said in my opening remarks, uh, there are some atrocious stories here. At this point, behind the scenes of uh, the Lonyu, at this point, three chronic, uh, chroniclers of Qi uh, famously wrote down what had happened and named this Tsui Zhu as the murderer. And this is in many, many Chinese texts always quoted as uh, an example for uh, how an, uh, a good historian should behave. He simply writes down who did wrong what. But Confucius may have had uh, thoughts about this. In order to keep uh, uh, them uh, from openly accusing him as the sir of his murder, Sui Zhu killed one scribe after the other, only given up at the third person because they saw it. There was no sense in also killing him. They, they simply didn't change behavior. They behaved like they should. According to Confucius, Chen Wenzel then left the immoral state of Qi. Um, now it's interesting that there was another person in this state of Qi. This is the person, uh, the, the man called Yin Ying, who is mentioned also in the fifth chapter before. Uh, uh, and um, uh, this man also had to make uh, the choice now. Should I stay here because this is my duty as a loyal subject to my ruler? Uh, should I go or can I stay? And Ying Ying, other than um, this Chen Wenzi here, chose to stay in Qi. And he then made the following uh, duke, a wonderful person who was uh, reigning for more than 50 years successfully in the state of Qi. So he actually, by making this choice, uh, did something very good for the next ruler, and uh, so the decision wasn't so wrong after all. So I wonder here whether um, uh, the um, um, this Yen Ying considered the behavior of Tsui Zhu to be uh, to be at least partly justified. To kill his uh, ruler was correct because why did this uh, duke have to go after the wife of? himself after all, I mean. So this uh, is also a, uh, an idea, it's not written in the text, but you can think about this. It is interesting to know that Yen Ying, uh, after his death, got the posthumous name of Yen Pingzi, which means the equilibrated one. And I actually wonder whether there's an implicit judgment on the story just recounted in this name. After all, this may have been the most important decision that this Yen Ying made in his life. One may even think that Confucius' words on him in uh, uh, a few passages earlier may have something to do with his behavior towards this Tsuju. The text says Yen Pingzhong was good, and, and I don't know whether I have this here. No, I don't have it here on the slide. Um, uh, he uh, said Yen Pingzhong was good at interacting with other people. He continued to treat them with respect over a long period of time. And maybe Confucius is commenting here on Yin Ying's behavior with regard to this murderer. He had known him for long and he respected him even after he in a rage had killed his lord because of the latter's inappropriate behavior. The attitude of Confucius with regard to Chen Wenzel, who is dealt with in 520, was different. Chen Wenzel had taken just the opposite decision of uh, this Yen Ying. Um, according to traditional standards, this decision at first sight looked more correct than the one of the Yen Ying. And yet Confucius clearly criticized him. Although Chen Wenzel was well versed in the rules that tradition prescribed, he did not make the best of his knowledge. Unlike Yen Ying, he did not see that the case was somewhat more complicated than he treated it. The old ruler had actually been at fault himself. 
Thus, I believe that in NLX 520, the attitude of the educated, which is the meaning of when Chen Windsor is actually criticized, uh, he kept to his principles simply too inflexibly in order to do something good with his uh, uh, behavior afterwards. Thus, this saying in the NLX 2 concerns the contrast of learned moral knowledge and the hard reality, which one could only master with the knowledge about how one really has to deal with other people. This is Jen, the Confucian, uh, 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 the Confucian uh, virtue that you have to master. If we look at these matters from this perspective, we might think that uh, Confucius is criticizing uh, 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 that what Confucius is criticizing concerning the attitude of Chen the uh, Chen Wenzhi is that he was just able to stick to decorum, which is when putting on a nice tie and showing off. <laughs> but uh, he did everything that etiquette demanded from him, but he was unable to judge on the circumstances that had actually led to the murder of the Duke of Qi. It looks very much to me that here again, we have a case in which someone is perfectly to, uh, able to do what is expected from him uh, uh, um, uh, in an ideal ruler-subject relationship, but that he's not really able to think beyond this. Both dialects of Confucius in Donier 520 thus serve to present the master's opinion on very important um, uh, historical incidents that seem to be easy at first sight, but were difficult to evaluate after a second look. And I again wonder whether Confucius wants to tell us that the posthumous name of when was actually given to persons who knew how to perfectly comply with rules in order to let other people think that they were morally excellent, while there actually were some severe flaws in their judgment. Both dialects in uh, NLX 520 thus serve to present the master's opinion on obviously very famous historical incidents that were difficult to evaluate. Um, Confucius obviously uh, counted uh, uh, um, 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 yeah, no, maybe I should shorten this a little bit. Now, um, I have I, I, one more passage, which I'm not going to discuss, mm -hmm. but uh, you will just want to tell you there's the next person who also had this, uh, uh, this surname when, and here again, if you look into the stories that are behind the sentence in the historical records, then you will find that this person is very nice uh, from the outside, but he is also doing some things that maybe, um, are questionably uh, a little bit. And so uh, it's, it may again uh, here be uh, that uh, this uh, at first sight seems to be a very positive judgment, but at second glance, it's not as positive as we may think. Um, this, uh, with this, we have described uh, the sayings of the fifth chapter of the analects in which the character win occurs. Only, uh, although only at the first place, there is the question of why the posthumous when, uh, name when was actually given. It does seem to me that this question is implied in the other cases uh, as well. Why did all these people receive the posthumous name of when? Interestingly, although one might expect to get positive explanations for the choice of the name, it looks like Confucius had some reservations as far as all bearers of the name uh, mentioned in this uh, chapter were concerned. The name, the cultured one, does not seem to have been as positive as the modern reader of uh, your translation of the way Analyx may uh, think at first sight. Uh, maybe this is what the ed editors who arranged the text of the analyst uh, want us to take home as a lesson about also about uh, the next statement in uh, the um, uh, no about this this statement about uh, Confucius himself, where uh, this student says well, he was wonderful in this when uh, when Jiang, so he really knew uh, what to do uh, about the forum, but also knew. Uh, to uh, not to disguise disguise uh, the wrong behavior, but he did it really well. 
it is interesting to note, and uh, I should come to my conclusion now. It is interesting to note that the last uh, man about whom speaks in our section from uh, Lonely Five is a man called Ning Woodson. Um, a man who um, has a posthumous name that contrasts with Wen. I told you in the beginning, there's this contrast between Wen and Wu, the civilized and the martial one. And Confucius, uh, uh, there is a story about this Ning, Ning Wu. This is really a wonderful man. About him, it is said, when good order prevailed in his country, Ning Wu acted the part of a wise man. When his country was in disorder, he acted the part of a stupid man. Others may equal his wisdom, but they cannot equal <laughs> his stupidity. What the text here wants to say is this person, this guy was much better than all the others who had this nice wind behavior, but at some point reacted in the wrong way. He knew quite well when the political situation is not so good, then you should just pretend to be a fool. And everybody will think, oh, this fool, let him talk, but nothing will, uh, nothing bad will happen to him. Um, we read in um, uh, Luni 523 uh, uh, then about the uh, master who complains about his students and he says, uh, let us go home, let us go home. Our young followers back in Lu are wild and ambitious. They put on a great show of brilliant culture, junk, which is also a character for this wing, but they lack the means to prune and shape it. Confucius was not at home, but he was thinking of his students who were there and who were getting put positions in Lu. They become politicians there, and he thinks, well, I didn't teach them what they actually need uh, uh, to know. This is going to be really dangerous for some of them. Uh, they haven't got enough education yet, and they may have learned what properly and uh, showing off in public may mean, but they can get into trouble. Actually, two of his students then later on died uh, in office, uh, not at home, but in two other places. And uh, I think this is one of the big taboos that the, the analytics are not talking about. So um, uh, what I wanted to tell you here is uh, that the examples of people called when that we find in the um, analytics serve to show which mistakes the students can commit when not finishing their studies with uh, their master and which dire consequences this may have. The analytics are probably the most important book of Chinese history as far as influence on Chinese culture is concerned. Yet what I wanted to show you uh, here in this talk was that you cannot just read them as such. In order to understand what Confucius uh, wanted uh, his readers uh, to know what he was actually saying, you need a lot of background knowledge of other sources which explain what these sayings may have been all about. Thank you so much. <laughs> We have about 10 or 15 minutes for some questions. So if there are any questions, uh, please raise your hand and and, uh, and this will call in. And we also may have some questions online from the crew as well. So I'll read those. Okay. I have, a, I have a quick question maybe to start off with this uh, about the common burial tradition then of the Lunu and and which of the and how do you judge the how do you judge in light of kind of how you're attempting to kind of recast some of these passages and think about them in light of other historical documents and stuff, how do you judge the commentarial tradition that comes down to us then? And what other, say, early, yeah. early scholars have, you know, from, yeah. you know, all the way, you know, from G back, you know, I mean, uh, you know, to Wang B, I mean, what are the, what are, oh, you yeah, know, also, early. well, I actually think that I, this is, what I have been uh, coming up with myself by reading other sources, you don't find it in the commentaries. This is what is interesting. And the commentaries start in China, start uh, with the latter Han Dynasty. This is uh, about uh, shortly after uh, 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 Christian era. So it's the first century. And then most of the early, uh, really early commentaries are in the second century uh, BC. But then you have already. 
um, a situation where Confucius is made a sacred uh, being. In the early tradition, Confucius is a man. Mm -hmm. And he actually thinks about life and he tries to uh, teach his uh, students uh, some things that are not holy at all, but that uh, 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 want to teach them how to live up uh, in a dangerous surrounding. And um, I think that starting with the latter hand period, uh, the commentators simply don't know this anymore. They, uh, this is the time when Buddhism comes to China, when Taoism becomes a religion, and then Confucius is transformed into actually the head of a religious school. Basically, I think this is what is happening. And so it's difficult to find in the commentaries, although they are here, there, uh, there are traces of this tradition, but I think that's, uh, that's, that's uh, problematic. If you take these early commentaries, uh, you can still find a lot of things, but when you take the Juchi translate, uh, the Juchi commentaries, you don't find anything of this at all. This is a thousand, uh, a thousand years later, and the problem of our modern translations is that most of the translators actually take the Juchi, uh, so the 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 commentary of 1200 AD, which is much way too far away from Confucius, and Juchi is up to something completely different. This is my critique of these translations that they don't show where their ideas actually come from. They probably often also don't realize where they take it from. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was really interested in what you had to say about Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu. Yeah, um, I know. Normally, <laughs> we think of Sun Tzu as uh, the reason he served three times was because the ruler um, had faults and yeah. recognized them that Sun Tzu was a good guy. But um, I thought you made a good argument that Confucius doesn't agree with that. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether you think some of that uh, displeasure could be seen in Sima Chen's biography. Oh, that's an interesting question, and I have to think about this. I, uh, I remember that biography. I actually interpreted uh, this as a positive biography. It's uh, the, the chapter on the lenient officials, and I think this. Uh, uh, this this biography wants to uh, show how you can uh, deal with other people um, while at his own times um, officials were very cruel with the people so he wants to say this man was was a decent guy whereas we today don't have these men but what is interesting is that in the analects you have this critical remark in the end that you have to do something about it so in all these other texts it's Completely positive, but there, no, it's not so positive. So something must have been there. Mm -hmm. Someone online just would like to know kind of how uh, the analects, um, are you aware of how, you know, say the present, current uh, leadership in the People's Republic kind of uses the analects and what is, what does that mean as like a commentary on some of the ways that the, the analects has been used? Yeah, well, um, I think, I mean, this would be the subject of another talk. Yeah. It's actually, no, it's, it's, it's actually, it's actually important. And I've yeah. spoken yeah. on this in, the, in other occasions. I, uh, not on what Xi Jinping now is doing with it, but he also has a book on, uh, with quotations from the analect that he uses in his speeches. Um, I mean, he's not himself coming up with them, but there are some people who around him who know, uh, know that he should use them uh, uh, at uh, some point. I think what is important uh, for the current government is that you have this discussion about uh, the law, ah, which is important, but then there's something which is much more important, and this is the this is virtue. So you are talking about virtue, and when you uh, use the analects, there is one saying in uh, chapter two where uh, uh, the use of far of the law is discouraged, and you should better use virtue. You should, uh, in order to deal with the people, and this is actually the idea uh, or the, the 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 main thing. What this uh, these politics in China are all about? That on the one hand they know 
that they have to conform to Western standards. But this is an idea that came up with Jiang Zemin already 20 mm -hmm. years, more than 20 years ago. Uh, maybe it was even earlier that in the West, uh, they are all dealing, uh, making uh, government on the basis of uh, based on law, we find this a good idea, but there's something else, there should be moral values, and these are our moral values, which we uh, use, and they are even support, uh, superior to this Western use of the law. Yes. I think this is the basic uh, uh, thing that I would give as an answer. Here. Another question online is in uh, Analytics 618. Yeah. Confucius discusses the importance of being in harmony with kind of ornamentation and pattern when in substance. Sure. And was yep. wondering if this could be kind of, does this kind of support your argument of when serving as a somewhat critical view of a person who only adheres to decorum? And that for Confucius, he envisioned the Junza to be someone who followed both ritual propriety in a way that is also aligned with inner integrity as pure and is also associated with ethical uh, attributes like Eve or righteousness. So that's a very good question. I think I've been mean, considered this passage, you know, what uh, you're talking about is this is actually what I think that confusion is not against women, but he thinks it should be balanced by something else. And this J is. Uh, an inner substance with you have uh, 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 in your heart. You, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that uh, it's important uh, to have this these good manners, but on the other hand, sometimes you should also think about what you have learned and, and you have uh, to use your brain. That's uh, what you is. So. Any other questions? Okay. Well, We'll conclude here then. Thank you so much.